Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar Making Puff and Rock Moho in a TV series pipeline featuring Jeremy Purcell. Also joining us today is Victor Paredes from the Moho product management team. This webinar is a chance for you to see how a bigger animation production structured a pipeline around Moho to get the best out of the software as well as how it works with other departments in the production. Our presenter today is Jeremy Purcell, who was assistant director on two seasons of Puff and Rock for a total of 78 episodes. Prior to that, he was EFX supervisor on two feature films with Cartoon Saloon, Brendan and the Secret of Kells, and Song of the Sea. He's currently working on Cartoon Saloon's next feature, The Breadwinner, as well as in pre-production on their next Moho TV series. And now I'll hand it over to Jeremy. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm just going to run through and give a very brief uh, background to, to Puff and Rock, just so you have context for some of the pipeline and stuff that we'll be discussing. Um, so Puff and Rock was uh, the first Moho TV series done in Cartoon Saloon, and it had approximately 90 people working on it across every aspect from legal to animation to backgrounds, just all, all the departments. And within that, we had like a technical director, a pipe, Python developer, myself, a project manager, line producer, department supervisors and coordinators that were all geared to making the pipeline work efficiently as possible for that many people. But it started off as a as a book and an app that was developed that was created by Tom Moore, Lily, Bernard and Paul and Paul Young here in Cartoon Saloon and then they got a, a studio in Derry, Northern Ireland, Duggars to be involved. And when they came on board it, uh, with Penguin Books, it became a TV series. So the first, uh, the first best pipeline that anyone in, in TV could wish for, uh, when it runs as, as best as possible, is this kind of look to it. So it runs straight from script all the way to final edit uh, seamlessly, which is quite difficult to do uh, for 39 episodes. And, and takes all the people involved working every day to make that happen. But we had two studios working on it, so we had the pipeline split between the two studios. So Cartoon Saloon took the majority of the work um, here in Kilkenny, and Doggers, who were based in another country, 400 kilometers away, took another section of the work. But this meant that the episode was constantly shifting back and forth between the two studios. So we had to transfer uh, assets, files, and different formats back and forth reliably. Um, but most of the artwork creation was done in these couple of programs. So the storyboards were going through Storyboard Pro uh, straight into Final Cut. That was in, in easy enough. Then Photoshop into Moho and then into After Effects. So Moho was really at the center of everything that we were doing, and every department touched on Moho at some stage or ended up in a, in a Moho file uh, somewhere along the way. But when, when you're tracking this many people and this many assets, we needed help from another program. So for season two, we used uh, Shotgun. So Shotgun is, is basically a giant uh, database website that kind of holds everything on it. So, and all the production people had access to it from, from all the coordinators all the way through to the supervisors and director. So we had 80 episodes, 2,273 scenes, 506 characters and prop assets, and 1,383 backgrounds uh, all tracked uh, through this system. But Moho doesn't natively talk to Shotgun, uh, so we had a vendor farm in the middle between Moho and Shotgun for the animators and the composite team. So Deadline is, is, is the vendor farm that we use from Tinkbox. And we also had both the, both the Moho files and the After Effects files in there, and our Python developer developed scripts through Python to make sure that every program was talking to each other in the best way possible and that 
everything to flow naturally in the pipeline. Plus, when you're working with two studios, we ran into a, a, a lot of issues, such as actually Cartoon Saloon is a PC-based network. Dog Ears was a Mac-based network. So the, the linkage in the internal links within the whole files were different uh, in different locations. So we went about different ways to try and minimize the errors of transferring files back and forth. So we merged the folder structure between both studios. So the, the episode folder structure of everything was in exactly the same place in both studios. And that was something that we stringently maintained with the coordinators. We had scripts for changing the internal file, link, file links. So every time a file was, or an episode was sent from Curtain Saloon to Dog Ears or back again, it was processed through a Python script that would alter the internal file from a PC link, uh, for PC network link to a Mac network link and, and back again. Um, and then we had different ways of dealing with the models as well in that we created the, the idea of a master model. So when reference models came in, we had the builders were working what we call a master and they would create a referenced version of it that was a child and the child was the only file that the animators would ever import. They would never import from the master in case the master was being worked on at the same time as they needed to import a scene so they wouldn't import something that was half finished. So it was quite a lot to, to sync through uh, Google Drive. But to talk specifically about the artwork, um, because that's much more of it up to, up to now, it's been very broad pipeline discussion, but to talk specifically about the artwork in it. Um, so the three main programs that we have are Photoshop, Moho, and After Effects. Uh, Photoshop was used for all design elements before going into Build and Rig, um, for all the layouts that were made and all the backgrounds that were painted. Uh, Moho was used for building and rigging all the characters and assets that we had, uh, all the character animation that was done, all the effects animation that was done, we had background animation, so that would bring finished backgrounds in and animate grass moving and stuff like that. And we also had composite layers uh, within the file. So they were masks or animated masks that were easier to track with the characters in Moho than doing so in After Effects. So they, even our company got quite experienced with Moho and making changes to it and, and doing their own animations and stuff in in the program when they use. Okay, so I just wanted to, to bring one character to give you, you know, bringing one character from the very, very start to a finished model build to show you how, how long it can take us and how much work goes in from, from all the people. So this is Una, who is our main character in Puffin Rock, uh, she, and we wanted to build one model that could do as much animation as possible within the series. So rather than switching uh, to different models or any or different poses or anything like that, we wanted to to put a lot of work into one model that would do everything, and we ended up that this one model did about 90 to 95 percent of her animation that was needed uh, over the two seasons. But to do that, we have to put an awful lot of work into it. So she was, this model build was about three months work uh, to, to build. And we actually ended up building her twice. So we built uh, what we call a Frankenstein Luna, which, which we built the first pass of her, added all the bones that we wanted to do, made all the suggestions that we wanted to make with the model, um, and it just gets more and more complicated and, and dragging, and then we knew where we wanted to go with her, so we started again from scratch 
uh, with the rigging team, and they built a completely new Una um, that was m much easier to control and, and much less buggy than the first one. Um, so before going into Moho with the build, our designers do everything in, in Photoshop or, or sometimes Flash, depending on the, their preference for drawing. Design everything as as still images because it's it's quicker and easier to check everything in that way than to, to build rigs for for it. So this is one of the initial turnarounds from from Luna, um, where all the, the volumes are checked and uh, the design of the different head angles that she works uh, works out are uh, designed. So with that, for instance, we have head turns in the model but her profile head and her three-quarter head and her front head don't exactly match up. They're, they're tweaked uh, in each design so that it's not, it's not like a 3D model in that it turns, it's that the design works for that head angle all the time and the animators had rules about not showing in between poses and stuff like that. But we, not only do we design the turnaround for it, but when we talk with the animation supervisor about what kind of stuff they want to do with the with the character. We design different head angles and stuff like that. So these are the initial designs for the Una looking up and down. Because we knew we wanted her to have we knew we wanted to be able for her to look up and down and left and right and, and do certain stuff like that. So the designer designed everything and the rigger then had a template to work off. It, it might change subtly when it when it moves into into rigging because we have to make adjustments for stuff that, that is just not possible, but it at least gives a good template. We also designed this, this question stretch for the character. So we we wanted to have squash and dress within all the characters, so we actually built it in as a smart action to design it all. So the, the animators would use one bone to control it, um, rather than squashing and stretching the bones themselves to create it. And that way we could set the maximum amount and the minimum amount, so that it, it, she was never too squashy or too stretchy. And we put a lot of work into the number of expressions and match shapes because with these type of models we made the decision early to design each default expression so that the animators were choosing from a range of expressions rather than we were relying on them to come up with expressions and they could subtly change these default ones by using the blink to, to narrow the eyes more and that kind of stuff to change so that it wasn't a cut and paste uh, templated expressions all the time, but they still were starting from from a starting point that was similar to everybody, so that everything looked the same. So not only do we do twelve different expressions per character, we have um, multiple match shapes that are both happy and sad match shapes, and all of these expressions and all of the match shapes uh, have to work inside. The head turning left and right and looking up and looking looking down. So, um, actually, our, our main riggers that worked on it were 3D riggers who could visualize the 3D aspects of them, and it was a lot easier for them. And then we produce uh, color models for all the different times of uh, for daytime, which will be these neutral colors for Una. Uh, she she has nighttime colors. She has uh, colors for the for the snow episode and uh, different colors for underwater and stuff like that. So that um, we use a script then to process those palettes to be different for each for each episode. And then sometimes the designer has to design special poses, uh, which these are more on an episode by episode basis, um, which are generally based on the initial model 
of the character with usually just a costume change or a slightly new angle to it or for instance you know, sitting down so we see the bottom of her feet and stuff like that so they would be small additions that we make to the model all the time so uh, over the two seasons uh, Una and we never stopped working on Una we were always adding new things to her but because we were doing all this stuff and that, that so much there was so much possibility within within Moho to do anything that the animators wanted <laughs> within within reason we ended up uh, a three or four page document of, of rules for the animators to follow so that they could maintain consistency of, of the look and of the animation across uh, the, the 15, 16 animators working on the actual show. So these are this is an example of, of how much I watch to show when, when Una is looking left or right and always maintaining uh, some of the white on the back of the eye uh, which was important for from the art director for the design of the show. Okay, so I'm just going to show you, um, the, after all that, the model of Una. So this is this is the finished model, which you'll see uh, has gone up to. We had a tracking system of numbers of. So every time a small change was made to the model, she was increased incrementally by numbers. So she's version 3.31, which was continuously increasing and working on it. Um, so all our, all our colors are by styles, so that were easily changeable, and that meant all the colors across the entire episode were always the styles in the files so that we knew exactly what color they were and we could access those styles with scripts. So. so we use a color coding system for the different uh, bones that control different smartphones that control different things. So. So head controllers tend to be blue, main body controllers are purple, eye controllers um, for direction are green, and blink controllers for pupil size and stuff are yellow. Um, so this is actually based on on how they are listed here in in the timeline. So we we went with the idea that the animators would work from broader actions down to smaller actions so that when they're at the top here they would want to make big action poses and then they could scroll down later on and make their smaller more adjustable blink poses. Uh, so Some of the head turn up and down, which which when you do it quite slow, you can see all the different elements sliding. So we had rules about how fast that could be done, and all the head turning. We had simple eyes left and left and right. And down, and then for modifications of, of eye directions and stuff, we we built controllers just to control the back pupil, so that they could make subtle changes for eye direction within it, and then we can increase and decrease the size of the pupil, as well as expand and blink the entire character. So most of the most of the construction of the model goes into the head of the model and the expressions of the model, um, especially on, on Una and the animal characters. Their, their bodies are quite simple in terms of how they work. They're, they're just main bones with no, no real smart boning in, in any of them. 
and we have uh, two stages to a model build. So we have build and then we have rig. So build is where all the layers are set out and nothing is nothing is rigged. So this is the last stage for the design team to call any changes that they want to make to it. So they would adjust colors or adjust textures or anything like that at that stage. So because once we start rigging and start doing the smart actions, that's when it becomes very difficult to make uh, vector changes to it because it has to be tracked throughout all the smart actions. Um, so that, that's stages that are approved by the design and the art director stage. It approves those stages. And then once the reading starts, it goes to various people to be approved. So the animation director uh, approved the rigging. Um, I checked the rigging and we showed it to the director as well, the rigging to make sure that everybody was happy that we were getting enough from the model that they wanted to be able to do in in the, the animation for that particular character. So you'll also notice here uh, at the top that Una is scaled to one between the two uh, bone, the main bone layer and the folded bone layer. So Uno was our default size relationship for everybody. So every character after Una was designed standing beside Una. And every character and prop uh, built after Una was built standing beside that this scale size of, of one to one was maintained all the time. Uh, and we always knew all the way through the process that the size relationship was correct between every every model. Um, so we have a we have a a build rigging rule as as much as possible to keep everything as tidy as possible, and and always try and keep everything one layer down for the animator. So the animator should never have to go uh, down and down down into a model here to make changes unless they unless unless it's completely necessary that 99% of the animation for the character can take place either on the bone layer or one level there. And so we have various scripts running on the character so that's that will change sub layers of, of the mouth. So if I turn this on and off you'll see that somewhere down here in the head and body there's half a beak hidden. There's a script running on this that finds the other switch layer uh, based on based on the code of this to change that switch layer at the same time. So the animator doesn't have to go down into the model to find it. So that works both on the beaks and the eyes. As I was saying, everything needs to work with the head turn. So all the expressions all the expressions and mechs and stuff work with the head turn. And then the only one that they might need to go then that's a bug in you know, uh, is the wings. So we had multiple wings built for Una so that she could do different things that were rigged. So these are the only things that they need to go down. We also had uh, two types of legs built. So one that was uh, rigged from the hip down and one that uh, rigged from the ankle up so that they could switch between different legs depending on what they wanted the animators wanted to do with them. Um, so once a character is built to, to this level it's it's never really finished for us um, especially with such a main character like Una um, because we we start uh, adding an um, animation that's that's being produced back into the models um, and with the reference model system the characters uh, the animators can update those characters in their scenes and they get new animation 
instantly in their scenes if needed. So in a particular episode, if uh, we had a new character of a lamb and one animator worked on the lamb walk and once it was approved, we put it back into the into the master lamb rig and saved it, updated it, and five minutes later, all the animators had the walk available to them in their scenes if they needed. So these are the general smartphones, smart actions that we that we use. We also use for the different uh, poses and costumes. We have uh, single poses that can be loaded in to the characters, uh, mostly to, to reset default views or add small additional elements like messy feathers on Luna or puff cheeks for under for swimming underwater and stuff like that. Um, and then this, these are all the actions that are animations that have been taken from scenes and added and added back in. So it's going here. So it's a lot of stuff that is a recurring trait that the, that the character might want to do. So the, the choice of, of what these would be and, and, and checking on them and improving them would come down to the animation director um, to pick the best ones that she wanted in there or to even uh, make small modifications within the, within the master model to improve them. Okay, so that's that's Luna, and you could you could spend an entire two-hour webinar talking about the individual layers and how we construct them, but I I don't want to spend so much time on it and then miss out on on the pipeline stuff. But that it's good to see how in depth the model constructions that we have go. But then, as we're saying, a model is never really finished for us because um, it's never really tested until the animation team get to use it and, and start putting it through its paces and scenes and stuff like that. So we de we developed a, a Google form that all the animators had, had a link to and they could submit uh, a model fix, a new model requests or animation actions to be added or updated or anything like that to the build team um, and the build team had a fixes error every day that they would just open the list, uh, going through, making fixes, uh, and then notifying the animators that, that worked on that uh, or requested that fix that it was done and that they could update the model now and all that and all that was tracked through shotgun and all that kind of stuff. Um, so how uh, Moho starts in our pipeline is once we have the storyboard finished uh, we and the layout's done, we do a pass that's called scene prep. Um, so scene prep is where we finalize the character sizes within the scene because we're using the actual models. Um, we set up the folder structure of the scene. We plan some of the action scene very basically and we walk characters in and out of in and out of scenes. Um, so a lot of this is is one person's job that they spend about a week doing doing an episode to do all this. So part of the, part of that process is also actually creating the scene prep files and the folder structure for all that, which we have a, a which our Python developer wrote a script to do that so that we can create seventy to eighty files uh, within five minutes. Um, rather than all doing it by hand, because the because the way that we have file structures is that they're predictable for for scripts to be able to do stuff. Uh, so this is a this is a sh short comparison between two scenes. So on one side, obviously, is the is the storyboard, and then we have a, a scene prep structure or a scene prep export 
that was approved and done by the scene prep artist. So the scene prep is what actually goes to the the animator for animation. So I hope this is is playing across uh, fine. So you can see that it's a very basic planning out of of the episode, but it's enough for the director to finalize and fix the editing and fix the camera within the scene so that background know exactly what needs to be painted, um, just in case there's not enough layout has been drawn by the time we get it in. So you can see in this scene, there's some layout that needs to be extended, so that would be done in background uh, to be added to it. That episode actually is Shiny Shell, um, which is from season one and on Netflix, if anybody wants to watch the final animation that, that came in for that. Uh, so then it gets to animation, which is where Moho really excels. Um, so the animators will get those C prep files, and uh, most of the animation team would be based in Derry, so we would have to process this, the files we're sending over Google Drive and transfer them, check them, make sure everything is working correctly, make sure the reference models are, are working correctly uh, and linking correctly between the two, between the two studios so, so that any changes made to the reference model will work for the animators in the scenes. Um, So this is a, a scene from season two. So some things that we always do in that I was saying that our files are predictable. Um, backgrounds are always in a folder called backgrounds. The character animation always happens in a folder called character animation. Um, we always have the animatic on uh, in the scene, whether the animator uh, can hide it in the in the in the screen, but it's always rendered for the animation director and for the director to refer to when they're approving the scene. Uh, we have different render safeties turned on, and then effects and props within the scene. So this is our, our basic structure. The characters are usually split uh, by different folders. Um, I'll just play this. Um, so, for instance, in this one, Una and Baba are grouped together because Una and Baba end up uh, Baba ends up on top of Una's head, so that this would be one render pass and then we would render all the shadows would be created and tracked in Moho for the for the composite team. Um, and if you notice up here on the scale that everybody is at is at one in the scale so that we know that everybody's size relationship to each other is correct. So in terms of what our timelines look like, if I come down here, we we strive a lot with the animators to be very clean and clear with their timelines so that it's very understandable to anybody else that needs to come into the scene because once they've animated the scene they it, another animator for whatever reason might need to take it over it might go to the animation director who wants to open the scene and make a quick change it might come to myself as the assistant director to make a quick change the composite team might need to open it and understand what's going on with it. So it's not just the animator working in the scene. There's the possibility of 10 additional people uh, that will open the file and need to understand what's happening in, in the file and what's happening with the animation 
very quickly. So it's a it's a very clear timeline to understand. It's very clear to see the keys of of Una uh, when she's moving um, and when she's not. So that changes can be made quite easily and quickly in the scenes if needed. We also have have the the ethos with, with dealing with the animation is is we want the animators animating as much as possible in that we don't want them uh, wasting time doing stuff that is that is repetitive. So you'll you'll see I have a have a Gary who's our Python developer section in my tools. So we we develop tools with Gary to do repetitive to, to, to take repetitive tasks away from the animator so that they don't so they can do things quicker and easier without having to um, without having to waste precious seconds that can build up over multiple times doing the same thing over and over again. So some things that we have that we built with him is we have a save a version script. So rather than coming up here to the save file, if an animator wants to save a backup version of this but keep working on the scene, there's a there's a script here that will when they press it, save a, a version to a designated versions folder for them to, to kind of take a backup and then save their current version of the file and then they can kind of continue working knowing that they can always go back to that stage if they if they mess up in some way but they never have to leave the program to do it. It's as simple as going to the file save to do that. Um, we have a tidy scene file script which uh, will collapse all the layers uh, that are present in the timeline. If the animator has, has put the animatic on hide, it will turn it back on and do repetitive actions like that um, so that when the next person who opens the file, they're not opening, they're not opening a file that's all broken out like this and they have to have to understand what's, what's going on. They get a, a very clean file to start off with and that they can start using. Um, different scripts like hide, hiding purple layers that the animator can designate to be uh, to be purple. So you see they're clicking it. This the script hides the layers and click, clicking it, they come back on. So if they need to have reference animation or uh, poses drawn out or something underneath, they can tag it as purple and they can hide it and unhide it very quickly without, and these can be shortcutted, so without actually having to come down here to click multiple layers at the same time. So we're always looking for stuff like that that will make the animator and the rigging teams life that bit easier so that they're spending as much time as possible being creative rather than being repetitive for, for smaller tasks. So bigger things that we do with the scripts, as I said, would be converting links to go to a Mac uh, internal link system or changing the color of the characters to nighttime and so like that. So we can pro process an entire episode in, in 20 minutes-ish to, to convert all the characters to nine time once we have different reference models built for that. So after the animation is done, then we, we go back to, to shotgun for the animator. So the animator has scenes assigned to them in shotgun. Um, so when they need to, uh, they we, we don't have any animator doing their own renders. So we use the render farm for all that. So this is a, a version of the page in Shotgun that the animator would have, and they would create just hit submit a version and then create a version. And because we have the folder structure structured to be predictable for the scripts, uh, the render farm knows exactly which ASP file to 
access based on the based on the name, and it renders that file and sends the rendered scene through to uh, the animation director for approval. So the animation director can can watch it at her own time and give back notes. So all this is is done through Shotgun uh, with the render farm and the Python scripts in the back end. Uh, so these are the type of notes that the animator animation director can give back. So she has both visual stills that she can create that are based on frame numbers, and she can add additional text as well to explain stuff. If needed, she can also just open the file and make a small change herself and resubmit a render before it goes to the director and that kind of stuff. So then she would approve all the scenes before the director sees them and then the director would review them as an entire episode. But once the character animation is done, then we're still not finished with most of the scenes. So most of the scenes would have effects animation uh, to be added or background movement to the to the grass, to the backgrounds. So the grass would blow a little bit in the wind. The, the One of the characters would move the background element uh, and it would have to, to react to the character moving. We have uh, a lot of insects and, and environmental characters that were added by a composite team flying around. Uh, any additional masks or anything like that that were added um, would be checked or would be done in Moho as well for rendering. And then because there's all this information going into the into the files and there's a, we like to, to quality control check everything along the way. So every file from from every scene uh, is opened and checked by a technical checker. So they they would open and check and make sure it looks like this and make sure the, the, the characters are structured correctly and in the correct folders and stuff like that so that the composite team is not wasting time doing something that that's repetitive and stuff like that. So that's something that the animators learn to maintain uh, for their production. And then the composite team would bring it into uh, the render farm again. So all our all our shotgun animation renders would be would be quick times, and then all, all the uh, character renders would be uh, PNGs from from the composite team. So the composite team uh, learned uh, Moho and had to and had to use it and and make changes and fixes themselves, uh, and they would use the the layer comp feature. So in in this particular scene. We can expose just the different uh, layer comps that were rendered out for each individual each individual thing for for the composite team to put back together in, into After Effects. So that was dealing with layer comps is a is a great way to minimize the re-rendering of scenes. So in technical fixes or anything like that that we might have um, later than the load after the compositing in the final technical checks from the, from the post-production head, so from the TV uh, station, we could go back in and if there was a technical fix to be made to Una, we could just change her fix, re-render her layer comp uh, only and, and within Deadline, we can, we, because we have the After Effects within it too, we can tell Deadline to trigger the After Effects render once the layer comp is finished rendering, so that the compositor actually never needs to open the After Effects file if it's a small animation fix that needs to be, that needs to be made to it. Uh, so then, once everything ends up in After Effects, uh, we're, we're for the most part, finished with with Moho. Um, but in Cartoon Saloon, we're quite devoted to, to using Moho uh, for a lot of things. So just as an example of what we've done with it uh, between two feature films. So uh, Song of the Sea was, was released uh, last year, 2015. 
Um, so that was produced before uh, Puff and Rock was was started. And in Song of the Sea, there's there's two completely two complete scenes or three complete scenes animated entirely in Moho. So all the characters and background elements and stuff like that were animated. We used it a lot to do background elements. Uh, we did some vehicles and boats and stuff like minor elements within within the film in in Moho. And then the breadwinner, which is coming out next year, um, we have an approximately about 15 minutes of, of the film is entirely done in Moho, and we have a background uh, character animation team, which isn't all the crowds and stuff entirely done in Moho. So we've, we've really started using it to to be more efficient in in our workflow within our pipeline. Um, I'm hoping that everybody has uh, loads of questions, or if they would want me to clarify anything, uh, to to I can easily go back and talk about it. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Jeremy. Um, it, ha it has been very interesting. And yes, there are several questions, so don't worry about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. The first one here is um, how many different versions of each character did you need to complete one episode? In in terms of the the rebuilding of it, um, usually usually the character might go through uh, if it's a new character. So if it's if it's the, if it's the new character that I mentioned, the mom. Uh, went through maybe two or three uh, adjustments and fixes while the episode was being animated. Um, but if it's a character like, like Una that we're constantly constantly working on, um, there might be uh, 30 or 40 versions of Una. So so she's, she's ever so slightly different in almost every episode um, because we're always making, it, it might not be anything that the audience can see because it might be just new animation is being added to her actions panel, um, but she is ever so slightly different and tweaked and, and adjusted uh, from the very, very first episode to the very, very last. She might be slightly visually different. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you. Now, another question about uh, the character is itself. Um, are the faces um, are the faces in switch layers, or maybe you are using a smart bones in combination with switch layers? Uh, I can just bring it in. It's it's. Um, let me just reset everything back. Uh, so it's it's a smart action. So it's so it's rather than switch layers. So it's a, it's a slowly adjusting. So I can go down into, say for example, her head layer here, and you can see the different keys that have been placed in by the by the bigger. So we build um, we build with the anticipation of turning the head. So if you count the number of points on one side of Una there should be exactly the same number of points on the other side of Una. So we know that, that we can use the same number of points for her to, to recreate the, the head going both ways, if that makes sense. Okay, okay, perfect. Now, um, related to that, um, how is the structure made on the character? Uh, because it doesn't look like pure vector. Is it's is it done in Photoshop or in other terms? I think how do you get the natural look uh, from Moho to fit in the in the look the series ha has? Sorry. Um, it is uh, textured brushes. So um, if I just zoom in here, so if you if you look at this particular point here or this point here, and I turn on brushes, you'll see here, it just 
the line becomes a textured brush. Um, and I can pull up his body, so you'll see that's the brush that's been applied for to create this effect. So a, a lot of um, all the characters, uh, including the, the sheep and the lambs, if, and, and I think on the on the Smith Micro blog, there's a, there's a picture of a salmon that we recreated. Um, so they're they're all entirely vector uh, vector recreated by our by our build person who really became quite specialised in in being able to match uh, Photoshop textures with brushes that she would create herself within uh, within Moho. Okay, okay, perfect. And related to that, um, do you create your own brushes, or do you use the the brushes included in the software? Uh, both. Okay. We we would create our we would create our own. Um, yeah, I can show you. So there's there's quite a lot of additional ones that we've created uh, in there somewhere. Um, that that the builder would recreate as she needed to match the to match the texture that the designer has put into Photoshop. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, let me continue here. Um, okay, so how do you um, ensure all the expressions work with the head turn because you, you have several uh, smart bones there and you, you seem to be always uh, mixing them in the animation. How do you, how, how are you sure they work together? Um, uh, so it's, it's possible to, we, we build one complete head one complete head turn with with a neutralize first, so, and er, then every expression is actually just a modified version of of this eye. So if I go down to the actual um, eyes, so they're just uh, our script controls the blink controls the eyelash separately, so that's why that's not moving. But all these additional eyes are are based off this neutral one. So we design the neutral one and do the head turn with the neutral eye first. And once that's approved by everybody, then we can start um, just duplicating that layer uh, and modifying modifying just these vector points to 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 make it look like the expression that we want it to look like. So that we're not redoing uh, the head turn every single expression. We're we're doing it once and then slightly tweaking it and modifying it. But it's it's a it's it really comes down to the to the rigors um, just sitting and I can just sitting and and scrubbing and playing playing it over and over again and checking it and, and making sure it fits. Um, and making the modifications that they that they need. So something like actually going over this way is a lot more difficult because the the eyes are are changing scale and changing size uh, between the front view and the side view and the profile views. So that that's a little bit more difficult. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, here are two questions. First, uh, how much time it takes to finish the animation of an entire episode? Uh, with our team, um, they would have a pass for the for the director to look at within approximately two weeks. So, so two ten, weeks, ten days. Yeah. So, excluding that they're working, if they were working weekends, it would be ten days. Yes. Okay. Okay. And related to that. Um, how many seconds usually an, an animator can animate? Well, we had uh, 
different levels of animators, the more experienced and more junior animators that had different, uh, they were producing different seconds, different milliseconds, and it, it becomes then, it comes down to some scenes would have uh, five characters or once or twice ten characters <laughs> in, in scenes, so they would take a lot longer to do than, than one character just talking or reacting. But on on average, they they were doing um, it was about forty seconds a week an animator would would do. Um, but then we did have sometimes animators would would do a minute and a half. Uh, but that was very that was very rare. But but sometimes they could get up to that speed if they had uh, a lot of scenes that they could really uh, fly through. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, here is another question. Um, why do you animate at 25 frames per second? Um, that's just because that's our, our TV um, frame rate here that we were delivering to uh, to Nickelodeon and RTE in, in the UK and Ireland. So it was just that's their broadcast frame rate is 25. So uh, Breadwinner were actually animating on 24 frames per second uh, for the feature. Okay, okay, perfect. Now um, here is a, a question. I think um, I think many of us already know the the answer, but uh, someone is asking: Are the in-betweens drawn separately in Photoshop or Moho, or are they automatically rendered from the keyframes? They're they're automatically rendered. Um, so the, the, the different uh, main views would be drawn initially in Photoshop for the for the build team to trace and, and base it off. But then, uh, with somebody that's in, that is as important as Azuna is, um, we sat with a designer and went through every frame slowly like this, and uh, she could make changes and call adjustments and stuff like that to any individual in between that was being made uh, by by this by the Moho. Um, so it's a little bit of both. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, are there specific features in Moho twelve that have made a difference in your projects? Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, the pin bones we're we're really looking forward to using. Um, so something even something as simple as that as that is 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 going to be uh, very useful to us. Uh, the tagging system um, we're really looking into how to tag that uh, and integrate that into Shotgun as well, so that the there's more. Uh, talking back and forth between Moho and Shotgun and stuff like that. Um, a lot of it we haven't we haven't gone into a lot of testing with with version twelve yet. It's only really starting now because a lot of us were just finishing on the feature film. Right. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, what part of making an episode takes the longest? I would say uh, for us on Puffin Rock, it was probably the storyboard had the had the, had the longest schedule, or maybe the maybe the script, but the the storyboard um, because it was one storyboard artist working with the director, um, so they had the, they had the longest time to make changes and make fixes and stuff like that to create the initial animatic. Um, once it once it made it into into scene prep and into animation and layout and stuff like that, there was a team of people uh, in each department able to work on it and able to help each other out uh, to to make stuff a little bit faster. But yeah, storyboard storyboard and animatic is a, is is one person working on it with the director. Right. Okay. And. How many animators work on each episode? Um, it, it varied slightly. Um, 
I think because we would have uh, juniors or, or trainees and interns and stuff uh, visiting and working on it. Um, somewhere between um, 10 and 14 at any one time, uh, depending on the episode and when the episode fell in into the production schedule. Okay, okay, perfect. Um, what what other software do you use for animation? Um, in the studio, uh, we use TV Paint. So TV Paint is is the software that's that's used uh, primarily for both Song of the Sea and and The Breadwinner. Um, so it's all uh, the the other room is all uh, hand drawing animators uh, working in TV Paint. Okay. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, let me see here. Well, there, there are many congratulations and thanks for sharing your, your knowledge and your cool projects. I am trying to get uh, some <laughs> questions. There are a lot, so navigating in this is, is kind sure. of hard. Um, let me see. Do you have separate rigs? For the characters back view or three fourth back view, or do you build that into the standard rig? Uh, no, we, we build each character uh, of the turnaround, each each view of the turnaround separately. Um, because of, because this was a preschool show, um, uh, the three quarter front uh, model was was predominantly used for. Um, for most of the scenes, so that's why that scene, that model takes priority over the other piece. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, how do you do lip sync? Do you import the final audio and a scrub on the timeline, or do you use a tool like Papagayo? Uh, we we import the, the final audio, so. I, uh, Zoom in here to Luna, and if I turn on the animatic, so you can see the audio is here. So the audio is actually inputted as a, as a separate file um, in case the animators need to have the audio of each character separated out. So they can have each character separate or, or the narrator taken off or if there's music interrupting and, and they go in here. So, and then they just uh, select switch layers. Um, from here to to just scrub the audio back and forth and they just uh, select the different notes that they have. So from A to G here are just different versions of the mesh being slightly more open each time and stuff like that. Uh, and then slight, then some additional expressions, notes and stuff, and then the same with the sad um, would match the A to G, would just be sad versions of what's up here in the happy ones. But it's just a switch layer uh, that the animators just scrub through and, and select the match that they want for the lip sync. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, do you find do you find it easier to animate a complete body body turn around on in 30 60 degrees in moho rather than flash or tomb boom? Uh, yes, I would say uh, for us working in this, yes, we um, we've always found it easier to 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 work in moho to do that. Um, Rather than going to, rather than going to flash, um, I suppose if you if you're working in flash or or to boom, you can just draw it and, and it's a lot easier to do it that way. But to working with the with the models and stuff, um, we find it better in in Moho for doing it. Okay, okay, perfect. And I think uh, we we will we will be. 
we will start to close the webinar now. Um, so, what was the resolution of the rendered scenes in Puffin Rock? Uh, they were rendered to to HD. So, uh, let me just just check the, the project settings here. Uh, our file constraints were, were 2304 by 1296, um, which is slightly uh, slightly bigger than HD, um, because we, we always render a little bit extra space for characters entering and leaving the scene in case the compositing team need to adjust the camera. So they always have that little bit of extra 10% space of a character on the edge of screen if needed, uh, which is what represented by our by our render safeties. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you. And I think this one will be the last question. Okay. okay. Um, so someone says, uh, I impressed by the whole production workflow setup. Uh, has Moho in your opinion matured as a professional production tool? What is the biggest challenge working with Moho in such a big team? Um, yes, I, I would say it definitely has has matured. We, we we've been using it. Um, the first project uh, that that we used it in was Brendan and the Secret of Kelds. It appeared in three scenes, I think, um, of that. So that that's almost ten years ago, um, and we've done other productions. With with Moho and each time uh, we come to do a new one, it it's better for for the production, um, in, for a professional studio. The 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 biggest thing that they that have been added that uh, is the reference models. So for us to be able to update and add animation to to a character, and for every animator then to have access to it almost instantly. Um, is is uh, groundbreaking in terms of, of a production for us to be able to do that uh, and to make changes and to make fixes uh, a lot quicker with with a 70 or 80 scenes within a within a an episode um, in terms of of the biggest challenges we face with it um, is making sure that um, the models are that there's no human error being created within the models or or stuff moving in that. I mean that that I can have this particular scene open, and um, another animator can have this particular scene open at the same time. So that's that's something that we're working with in our in our pipeline for the next show to to combat that. Um, but that's the that's the one thing as opposed to uh, if you think of Toon Boom's templates, uh, in Toon Boom, if you have a, have a template, if uh, only one person can have that on the network open at any one time, it's locked by Toon Boom for for our network team. Um, but we think we have we have a workaround within our production pipeline for the next show that will that will solve that. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Jeremy, um, and I, I say this personally, it was a great webinar and very, very interesting. So thank you very much for your time. And now I will uh, give the pass to Tim to finish this. All right. Uh, thanks, Victor. Uh, big thanks to Jeremy and to everyone for attending. Uh, be sure to watch for an email in the next few days. It'll have a link to watch the webinar replay. And then uh, check our website at my.smithmicro.com slash moho for more information on moho and to uh, see our upcoming webinars. Uh, also check us out on social media. The links are there on the my.smithmicro.com if you go to the moho page. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.